So what I'd like to do is uh, discuss infectious retinal and parietal diseases with you. And before we get started, I want to do a little pretest. I uh, have 10 slides. I'll just do your best to guess, get the closest diagnosis that you can. And then at the end, we'll repeat the test and see if I taught you anything. So, so uh, we'll get started. The pretest, you each have a piece of paper. Put your name and email just so I can communicate with you. I'm not going to share the test results with anybody. It helps me know what I need to work on and how to, how to present the material in a better fashion. So here's our first, whoops, here's our first slide. Take a quick look, give your best guess in terms of the diagnosis. The picture is not that great. Oh, just number these and write them down? Yeah, if you would, that would be great. Yes, let that, <coughs> just put a number, best guess diagnosis Ooh, there. It is, it's, it's not as good as it was. There's 10 <laughs> questions. I have 10, 10 okay. uh, slides. Give you a few more seconds. Can I put a differential now? You can put a couple, sure, sure. And, and if you're not sure of the exact yeah, diagnosis, yeah. put but the closest thing you come to, uveitis. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Oh, okay. But you get as close as you can. <laughs> you bet. And you can put a couple if you like. Here we go, number two. It helps a little bit that you're in a lecture of infectious uveitis. Yes. <laughs> All right, number three. <laughs> I have extra paper if anybody needs it. Good. Number four. Again, the closest you can get to a diagnosis is fine. This gives me some insight. Good. And here we go. Good. Good. All right, here we go. Good, here we go. The other eye is normal. Is all photos you took? No. No, I was going to say we have to see stuff that's interesting. Okay. So this is a picture focused on the retina. This is focused in the vitreous. I'm really surprised how bad they're projecting. Well, they're not too no, bad. Good. They're good. They're good. From the side, it looks. It doesn't yeah. look so good. Yeah, Welcome. Get a pretest. A little pretest here. And our last one. This is sort of extra credit. If you get this, then you graduated with honors. You'll just give your name. Yeah. Yeah. And we'll we'll liver train. Train. This is the end of a pretest. We'll do a post test. You can give me the specific diagnosis or anything general is fine. All right, They're very good, thank you. So I think we're set here. So we're going to review infectious etiologies of retinal and parietal uh, uveitic processes, which cover a, a variety of, of organisms. Uh, your book refers to protozoas, which are now under the kingdom of protista, which we may talk about a little bit greater later. Thank you. Go ahead. Here we go. So, looking at it from a general perspective, when you have a patient with ocular inflammation, uh, 
the, the key to diagnose the IU, if I have a patient, I walk into the room, then I realize they have uveitis. They've done the review of systems, but sometimes it's not adequate. So after I'm through, I'll actually give my printed uveitis questionnaire. I make them sit down, fill it out thoughtfully, sometimes with my text, so I get all the detailed information. That's key to the diagnosis, is getting the history that you need on a given patient. And a comprehensive examination is used to classify. Is this an anterior uveitis, a posterior uveitis, granulomatous, non-granulomatous? What structures are involved? That'll help you to better define uh, and classify the uveitis. After, and then, then because you'll be familiar with diagnostic options, you can then do a focus testing. No, go, no, no shotgun approach to uveitis testing. Um, you can focus exactly what, what you need to be ruling out in a specific case. Um, <coughs> it's important to differentiate infectious from non-infectious for obvious reasons. You don't want to put somebody on immunosuppressants or steroids if they've got an infectious uveitis. And then it is very important to get a uveitis or an infectious disease specialist that, you, that, that works with you, that knows you and knows how to manage these patients with you. Because if you just send it to any person down the block, they, they may not know quite what you need them to do to help you out. Communication is key. So, we're going to start with the herpes group. The herpes group has a lot of different subtypes. You're familiar with simplex, zoster, Epstein-Barr, cytomegalovirus. The other H uh, HHV human uh, herpes virus uh, group members aren't often associated with uveitis. So, I'm going to try to follow the outline of your book, Cytomegalovirus. It's the most common congenital infectious syndrome and the most common opportunistic infection. So if you have somebody who's HIV positive or someone who's on immunosuppressives and you see a retinitis, think cytomegalovirus. Think the common things first. It's often seen with a CD4 count oh, that's pretty low. We don't see this as much as now as much as we did years ago. Now there's, there's three variants that are helpful to identify. Uh, classic fulminant, which is seen in people with really poor immune systems. People who don't have as bad a immune uh, dysfunction will have more of an indolent, indolent retinitis. And then there's this uh, 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 fairly unusual perivasculitis that you might even see just in young people who get, who get CMV and they're healthy and they'll get, they'll get a perivasculitis. Let's talk more about this. Here is the classic fulminant CMV retinitis. You get the uh, retinal opacification. It often extends along the vessels. You get the Y retinitis and you get the hemorrhage. It often starts posteriorly, but it can be peripherally and just slowly creeps, creeps, creeps. Depending upon how bad your immune system is, it may come on very aggressively. But typically, we would see it sort of creeping along and the history is sort of months of floaters and decreased vision and such as that. Keep in mind these can be seen in people who are on uh, transplant medication and such as that as well. So that's your classic formula. Now, someone who has a little bit better immune system might present with an indolent CMV retinitis, where here the retina's pretty much been damaged, and then you have this edge, this leading edge, this sort of granular, and it slowly creeps, creeps, creeps. And it's important to identify this because you might think, well, there's really not much going on, but this is an active border and needs to be treated. Finally, again, in young people who are generally healthy, you'll get this frosted branch angiitis pattern. Now, sometimes you'll get front, uh, this, this frosted branch pattern with someone with indolent or with a fulminant as well. So that they're not always exclusive, but it's, it's helpful to uh, identify this particular pattern of CMV uh, uveitis. It's a clinical diagnosis. You, you look in, you have a history and say, this person likely has CMV. Yes. Um, with the indolent days or the indolent uh, category? Yes. Does that march towards the posterior pole? It does. And does that make sense? Do you? Does it what? Does that make sense? Or well, does it seem random? Oh, I see what you're saying. Well, I guess in, in some ways, they, they, they run out of tissue here, so you're okay. just marching where the tissue is. I don't have a good reason why it would start in the periphery and march posteriorly in particular. Anybody want to comment on that? Yeah. Very well. Good question. I'm sorry I don't have a good answer. So, in, in cases where you're not sure what it is, or let's say you say, well, it could be CMV, could be toxol in a real severely immunocompromised person, uh, could be other organisms, you can get a TAP and get PCR. Typically, though, you, you don't wait on a lot of these 
uveitis, the infectious uveitis. You'll treat what you think, you cover what you think. If you think it may be, it may be a herpes virus, maybe toxo, you're not sure. Treat for both, get the test, and wait for the outcome. Now the common panel includes these organisms, so when you order the PCR, and it's kind of interesting, I think, because, because any of those can look alike in an immunocompromised person. So it's, it's good to kind of cover that. Toxo can look like ARN, for example. Um, from a practical standpoint, I always wondered, because you're t you need so much volume for, for an AC tap, if it could, and you, if you were doing intravitreal injections, could you do the AC tap before or after for the PCR? And I asked around, and I don't know if you agree with this, but uh, Janet Davis down in Miami told me, absolutely can do the AC tap afterwards because the, you know, it's such a high sensitivity. Great point. Right, very good point. Thank you. Good morning. So, so, so that's a great point. Thank you for that. So the, the treatment, uh, first you want to manage immunosuppression. Uh, if, if, if it's an HIV patient, you get them started on the antiretroviral therapy. If it's a transplant patient, you notify their transplant specialist, and they, they may have to modify their immunosuppressive agents. You, 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 have, you have intravenous agents, and all this is in your book, intravenous agents and, and oral agents. And a lot of what you decide to go with depends upon the, the degree of severity of the uveitis. And, and, whether, and how if the macula is threatened, such as that. So if you have someone who is not, not, doesn't look real bad, it's more peripheral, you may just go with oral valgancyclovir. Remember, gal, valgancyclovir is different than valacyclovir. Um, the, for severe lesions that are threatening the disc or the macula, we'll sometimes use intravitreal valgancyclovir and foscarnet until things come under better control. <clears throat> The clinical course is you basically continue the anti-CMV therapy until the immune status improves, and then you can back off. Um, keep in mind immune recovery uveitis. There's some debate on that, this, but I think it's fair, fairly well established that once the patients recover their immune status, they may recognize the antigens without active infection, so you might get a low-grade uveitis, typically with cystoid macular edema, it has to be treated with steroids. In those cases, their detachment rates about 50 percent. So you got to keep a look on these these folks for late detachment. Let's talk about acute retinal necrosis. It's usually caused by HSV one or two or varicella, varicella zoster virus. You, acute unilateral loss of vision. It, this this comes on suddenly. You're doing well. All of a sudden, I, I was light sensitive. I was having some pain, some redness, some floaters, and my vision's getting worse. So CMV is more chronic. Uh, ARN is, it truly is acute. The fellow eyes uh, is, is usually later is affected in about a third of cases. Uh, they can get corneal edema, high intraocular pressure, typical of the viral uveitis. It can be a, they can be a pretty scary presentation. Um, they, they, they interestingly get an arteriolitis, so you might see arterial cuffing, inflammatory cuffing. It gives it a bit of a, a, a cue. And then this multifocal peripheral retinal opacification that rapidly coalesces and, and, and spreads. So if you have a patient that you think might have the disease, certainly you don't want to get them started with <coughs> treatment, but you won't see them back in a week. You might see them back in a day or two to see if you can document rapid progression. The, the detachment rate's very high with ARM. So, so this case here, you see a little bit of arteriolitis. You see these patches, these white patches, that all become coalescent over time. That's a pretty typical picture of fairly early acute retinal necrosis. Now, a more virulent form is progressive outer retinal necrosis, porn. You can, just, you can think of these maybe in somewhat of a continuum. This is much more serious, more immunosuppressed uh, individuals. It's, it tends to be more with the varicella zoster virus also. Um, it's Apache, tends to be more of a posterior presentation than peripheral. Uh, with, and, and typically, because they're not uh, very, they don't have much immunity, there's very little vitritis as opposed to acute retinal necrosis. Very little evidence of inflammation, just this terrible opacification. So it's a, it presents a little bit differently, but it's very rapidly progressive as well. Eventually, bilateral and detachments are very common late in the disease. Here's a, an example of progressive outer retinal necrosis. You see this, 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 this confluent white opacification. But notice there's not a lot of vitreous haze. In, in acute retinal necrosis, you're going to see vitritis. You don't really see much of that in porn uh, because they don't have much of an immune status. 
diagnosis, again, start treatment. You suspect this is what it is, get them on antivirals quickly. It's critical. Uh, uh, if, there, if, if, if you need to, put them in the hospital. Uh, we've, we've learned time and time again that, that if you do decide, maybe not for a porn, but for an RN case, they don't want to go in the hospital, you're going to treat them with oral agents. We've learned time and time again, you might want to give a written prescription, call them that evening, be sure that pharmacy didn't say, yeah, we're going to order your medicine, we'll have it in a week. You've really got to get on top of these people and get moving quickly. Don't forget your AC tap, or if you're taking them to the OR, you can get a vitreous tap for PCR. But again, it's going to take a while to get the results. Don't hold treatment for them. If you get patients with RN or porn, always check for syphilis. For one thing, syphilis can present in this fashion as well, but also there's, there can be coexisting infections. So how do you treat RN or porn? You have antiviral therapy, you have IV therapy, you have oral therapy, just like CMV. And, and there's debate as to which is better. And, and most people will depend upon how severe the case is, how, how, how threatened the, the vision is, and the compliance of the patient. If you think you're not going to be able to get this patient to take oral agents, put him in the hospital, get the IV agent started. All the meds, the doses is in your book. So I'll go over all that. Now, some folks feel that in, in non-immunosuppressed patients that prednisone can help to decrease the inflammation, decrease the inflammatory damage that you can see in this disease. It's somewhat debatable. In any event, you wouldn't start it after the first day or two to get the antiviral started anyway. Uh, adjunctive intravitreal agents, again, can be given if they're threatening the disc or macula. You don't feel it. You can really wait. You want to get something going quickly. And, uh, there's again some debate in terms of whether laser photocoagulation is, is useful. The idea is, is you get a, a particularly an RN, peripheral retinitis, and as that becomes necrotic, you're going to get breaks, tears, and detachments, a high incidence. So the question is, if you get in there early, let's say you do an early vitrectomy, clear the vitreous, get them on intravitreal uh, antivirals, is it useful to put a, a big a roll of laser around the area of retinitis with the hope of preventing detachment? And we don't really know how effective that is. But, but many people do offer it. I, I know I'll often do it. So that is the herpes virus group. Before no. I go on, any questions? Quick, quick question. Have you ever, you know, the, the, the distinction to me seems like it's, I don't know, I don't quite get it. It seems like, you know, the toxo you can have it in an immunocompetent or a compromised patient. Toxo, you say? With toxoplasmosis, okay. for example. And you don't call it two different diseases, it's just toxo in an immunocompetent. That's or a, a good question. Th these were just clinical presentations. And I think now, you're like your book, for example, talks about them together. Yeah. But they, 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 they came on, it's a spectrum. So have you, but you've never seen post um, adorotinal necrosis with, in a patient who's immunocompetent, correct? No. no okay. No. Okay. Good question. Thank Does you. the viral load make a difference? Say the viral, the viral load. Do you measure the viral load? I know that's a good question. I'm sure it must make a difference, but because it, 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 it's in sync with the CD4 count, <laughs> most of the studies indicate that when the CD4 count's real low, your viral load's going to tend to be high. I think you could probably, I think probably you could follow both, but, but it's in the most of the textbooks, they talk about the CD4 count in terms of the immune capacity to treat off the treat the organism. Great questions, thank you. So let's, let's switch over to endogenous bacterial endophthalmitis. Th these are cases of, of bacterial endophthalmitis that gets to the eye through the bloodstream. Hematogenous seeding. Uh, uh, about 40% of the U.S. cases are for endocarditis. And some of them are fairly subacute. So these patients aren't necessarily febrile and, and, and feeling symptomatic. Others are, of course, depending upon the organism. So you have to ask, listen to the heart, send to the medical doctors and if you're trying to find the source. UTI can cause uh, endogenous endophthalmitis. IV drug abuse is, is an important cause. Indwelling catheters, the typical list. Interestingly, in Asia, they get Klebsiella. About, about over half of the cases in Asia are Klebsiella related to liver abscess. And, and they get a, an unusual pupillary hypopion. Has anybody heard of pupillary hypopion? Isn't that odd? They, they, get, they get white cells that collect in the pupil, and sometimes it occludes the pupil. You, you look at you think they got a cataract, but it's a hypopion, it's in the pupil. You dilate them and you identify that it's not the lens. So it's sort of an interesting presentation. It's been said that a pupillary hypopion is somewhat typical or characteristic for Clemsiella. Anyway, 
I said consider intravitreal antibiotics in severe cases because if it's a strep or if it's a, it's a, a low-grade staph and, they're, and you, you see them in the hospital, they know they have endocarditis. They've got them on, anti, on antibiotics intravitreally. And it's just a small area of retinitis or a little bit of atritis. It's, it, it, a lot of these cases, you can just ha treat them inter in, with IV. You don't need to go inside the eye. But if they're severe, you may need to get the organism with a, a, a culture, and you may want to do intravitreal antibiotics as well. So the spectrum of presentation is wide. It's, it's, it's the history, the clinical scenario that's going to tip you off. Raw spots might be an indication when you see those. Usually they're collected or a little focal area of retinitis or just a fulmin and endophthalmitis, in which case you take them to the OR to get taps and such. I would add in Florida, it's so in Florida it's so hot and humid that you're going to get to fungal, that I think most of the endogenous we see is fungal. Although I think I had a bacterial. Probably, yeah, so. I've seen both, but you, you yeah. make a very good point. In, in the warmer climates, you're going to think fungus. That's a very good point. Okay, so, <laughs> so remember, fungus includes molds and yeast. So we're going to talk first about molds, uh, fungal endophthalmitis for molds. Exogenous cases are rare, meaning coming in through the cornea, a corneal infectious getting to endophthalmitis, that's rare. Um, uh, but fusarium is known to do that. Endogenous cases are often, but not always, in immunocompromised patients with <coughs> chronic lungemia, IV drug abusers, or a, a, another group of people to keep a check on. Um, Aspergillus and fusarium are the common organisms that are involved. And this concept is, it tends to be uh, subacute, but the prognosis is pretty poor for these cases. And we'll often use a vitrectomy, afetericin, voriconazole, and often uh, systemic antifungals. If you're treating the underlying source, you wouldn't just treat their eye. So, this is from Harry Flynn. He makes a point, and this is, I think is worthwhile pointing out here in this picture. It isn't probably pathognomonic, but, but it's very characteristic of aspergillus to cause a subretinal hypopion and a preretinal subhyloid hypopion. And that was why I put that in there. So, so if you have a subretinal and preretinal hypopion, that's very typical for aspergillus. Other infections can do it, syphilis can do it, but, it, but, it, but it, it's much more common. He treated this patient and he stopped the infection, but the, needless to say, they had a macular scar, so the vision was limited. But keep that little tip in mind. You're not going to see a ton of aspergillus, but it's a nice clinical cue. Just looking at that, how do you know that's a subretinal hypopion and not uh, just pigment? Okay, so you see a white area here. Mm -hmm. We don't see any pigment overlying it, so we know it's subretinal because it's, it's confluent and it's under the retinal vessels. Mm -hmm. So you're not going to get an infiltrate like this that's so confluent under the retinal uh, blood vessels within the retina. It's going to be under the retina. Mm -hmm. If it's under the pigment epithelium, you're going to see pigmentary changes and clumping, which you don't see. So, and you see this nice, smooth border. Clinically, this would be elevated. There's fluid, and then it, the fluid comes here. On an OCT, you would see that as well. And you can't see it very well in this picture. It's got a flat top like a, like a hypopion. Mm -hmm. So you know this is subretinal. And uh, even if you don't see the flat top, you know you have a subretinal infiltrate. You have intraretinal infiltrates, subretinal infiltrates, <coughs> and this is in front of the retina. Yeah. An OCT might help, the clinical exam might help, but this retinal vessel goes behind it. So you know this is pre-retinal. Mm -hmm. Does that help? Yeah. Okay. So that's kind of a weird one. It's extra credit, but I thought you might like to see that. Okay. So you can get, of course, fungal endophthalmitis from yeast. The most common yeast is Candida. Typical risk factors, uh, as with uh, as with other, as with the other endogenous cases, it's it's subacute in onset. These patients will say for weeks, maybe a month or two, maybe more. They've seen little floaters, and of course, when somebody says they have floaters, you want to say what kind of floaters you have. What do they look like? Because the in infectious and, for that matter, non-infectious inflammatory floaters are dot-like floaters. Mm -hmm. So see lots and lots of little dots. Uh, and then the, the vision slowly gets hazy, hazy, hazy. Um, the, the, the typical thing you're going to see are these vitreous fluff balls. That's a big uh, tip off for the diagnosis of candida. Uh, the diagnostic therapy of vitrectomy can be helpful. Again, limited disease you could treat with IV alone. Oh. But typically they were severe enough by the time they reach us that they need intravitreal. I put this in here because what is, if you looked at that, if I didn't tell you what we're talking about, I didn't have this title, and you looked at that, what would your diagnosis be or what would it include? Mm 
Toxin. Exactly. The number one cause of focal retinitis <laughs> is toxoplasmosis. So that you can differentiate this from toxoplasmosis, but as it evolves, you start seeing little fluff balls, and it kind of tips you off. So, so here the history would, would be the big cue <coughs> to help you with the diagnosis, because otherwise it's just a focal retinitis. And in this case, is there almost like a little star? There is, this? yeah. It looks like it. You know, I don't remember this particular case. I don't know whether this is wrinkling of the island. This is a young patient. I don't remember that's a wrinkling of the island. But you can get a little bit of a stellate change adjacent to retinitis. Anything that causes leaky blood vessels, the, the, it can leak into the outer plexiform layer. Then, as it precipitate, then the, the protein can precipitate in a stellate pattern. So you could get stellate, stellate pattern. But here, this is much more typical. You see a few little areas of retinochoroiditis, this vitreous haze, focusing on the vitreous, the big fluff balls. That really tips you off to uh, candida and ophthalmitis. Before I change, any, any comments? Yes. So we, we get a, a bunch of routine um, fungemia uh, DFEs to, to rule out um, eye involvement, ocular involvement. So, and I've read like 10, 15% of Fungemic patients will have um, involvement in the choroid or retina. And I was just wondering if you had a um, if you have a feel for what percentage might actually be true because that hasn't been the case with me. I haven't seen ten or fifteen percent. You think it, you think it's lower than that? Yeah. I think it's lower than that too. There was a recent paper. On that. I'll try to find it. I think, I think it was it's suggesting it wasn't necessary. Yeah, I think I agree. I get those consults all children's constantly, and I have I'm yet to see. Um, yet to see one that I was consulted for that wasn't consult that I wasn't consulted for by another ophthalmologist who saw it already. You know the ones that we see are, are at the end of the funnel. The routine consults have an exceedingly low positive rate. Then you get you get consulted in kids or adults or both. Both. Yeah. Yeah, mostly they, adults. Yeah, mostly uh, they don't consult for the adults and the other hospital services. They consult for kids um, uh, constantly at all children's. My very last uh, uh, consult as a resident for rule out fungal endophthalmitis had fungal endophthalmitis. So I would say maybe I got 50 in residency mm -hmm. and, and one had one go. So I think it was worth the, because, because a lot of times these patients are intubated and you yeah. can't, <clears throat> if they're awake, I think the, the yield is low because mm -hmm. you ask them, you know, but it's a lot of these patients are in the ICU. You make a really good point. If they're conversant and you come in, you're giving a consult, and you say, are you seeing new little tiny floating spots in the vision? And they say no. Yeah. <laughs> Odds are they're not going to have. When the Will's paper was 5%, and I think about a third of them were asymptomatic. Thank you. When do you guys recheck those patients? Because I feel like here we just kind of say if the patient is still fun. I say consult. I say no. I say no. <laughs> Intraocular fungus, PRN. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And can you um, speak to whether, so you said that some patients may be treated with only IV. Um, can you speak to, to where the lesions are when you treat them with only IV or where your threshold is? That's a really good point. For me, if there's not a lot of detritus, uh, I'm comfortable with that. For example, you have a patient who has known uh, systemic fungemia and has a little tiny area of retinitis but the vitreous is clear, they're seeing well, there may be a few floaters or, or minimal floaters, and I would be comfortable. Once you get a lot of vitreous involvement, I tend to be more aggressive. Does that, does that, uh, is that a concert with your views? More aggressive yeah, than I've done systemic. I've hardly ever done the vitreous. I've always done oral, actually. Okay. And it's yeah, worked yeah. really well. It and penetrates it well. Yeah, yeah. My threshold is a bit lower when there's a lot of vitreous involvement and their vision is down. And then is good. Yeah, I'll, yeah. I'll have, well, at the very least, yeah, if, if I'm going to go in, I'll usually clear out the vitreous first. Again, it depends upon the patient. If, if it's a young patient, they got a nice clear lens, right. then I'm a little more reluctant right. to go right. in the eye. Wait, well, well, I think, question. what's your threshold for protecting? Well, we're, well, 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 the, the point is that the, if the vision is very poor, or maybe the diagnosis is uncertain, you'll tend to go in for a vitrectomy. But, but if, you, if you can treat it systemically, you don't need to give intravitreal, you don't need to do a vitrectomy, you'll save their lens in a young patient with a clear lens. By, by, by not going in. And again, these are slowly progressive, so you don't have to jump. You know, start out, see how they do. Treat systemically. If after a week or two they're not doing well, operate. Some patients with, um, with very bad fungal endophthalmitis end up getting a vitrectomy, and oftentimes they get oil in their eye, and some of them still have persistent infection. That you actually have to treat them for 
months with um, intravitreal injections if they have bad abdominal You make a good point. Not all of them, of, of most of the cases I've taken care of are real straightforward. But I have one lady now who, who's been very recalcitrant. Oh, she's still coming in. I think I saw her. Yeah, I'm yeah. sure you did. <laughs> yeah, she is, is, so they're not all easy, that's for sure. All right. So let's talk about tuberculosis. You, don't, you won't see that much in the U.S., but you have to keep it in mind because we're seeing more international travelers and, and people coming in from areas where it's endemic, so we need to know about it. Uh, about a third of the world population has been exposed, but only about 10% get uveitis, so, so most people don't get uveitis. Um, you, you can get a primary uh, recent exposure or, or secondary, which is most of the cases that we see. So, uh, again, uh, we don't see much of the primary, but the secondary, you can get all kinds of, of uveitic co uh, complications from TB. Not unlike syphilis, that there's not really one, well, with some exceptions, there's very few patterns that you're going to look at and say, this is tuberculosis or this is likely TB. So you need to keep a high index of suspicion. I often test for TB in my uveitis patients, not, not just because the uveitis might be tuberculous, <coughs> But if it's non-infectious, and I might put them on immunosuppressives, you want to know they have not been exposed to TB to put them on treatment. So I'll often, I'm, I'm, uh, on my tests for uveitis, I almost always include syphilis, and especially for posterior uveitis, I usually include TB testing uh, as well for that Quan reason. Quantical these days, or, or tuberculosis? I use Quantiferon, yeah. yeah. Uh, does anybody still use the PPD skin test? Yeah, most people have switched to the ACRA. Hmm? If they're uninsured, it's a lot cheaper. Well, there you go. That's a very good point. Thank you. Oh, okay. Well, I'm going to go over some of the, some of the different. But keep in mind, you can have a chronic granulomatous uveitis, panuveitis, a waxing and waning course, vitreous opacities, macular edema, vasculitis, disseminated choroiditis, or a serpiginous-like choroiditis. And I point that out because that is one manifestation that makes you think maybe TB. And we'll talk more about that. So here is a serpiginous light patient. They got these little sort of serpiginoid lesions. It's not typically around the disc like most serpiginous cases, however, and that's often the case with the TB. And with TB, you'll often get a peripheral involvement that you don't tend to get in classic serpiginous, which starts around the disc, sort of migrates out. You'll get little satellite peripheral lesions in the, in the TB. So if you see serpiginous, think tuberculosis may need to be uh, tested for that. Here's the fellow eye with this serpiginoid like uh, thing. But you see these little choroidal lesions, those, are, those could be clearly seen without the serpiginous findings in TB. Here's an example of a granuloma from uh, tuberculosis. So if you see a, a non-pigmented choroidal mass, you would think tumor, but you also think sarcoidosis, TB, lots of other things you'd, you'd consider when you see a choroidal mass. So keep granuloma in mind when you see choroidal mass lesions. Just a very brief comment. You don't see this much in the literature, but in the older literature, there was felt to be an immunogenic response to the tuberculin protein, particularly in young men that would cause peripheral vaso occlusive perivasculitis. And they would get these peripheral capillary dropout, uveitis, macular edema, vasculitis, and peripheral neovascularization. Uh, you don't see much of it in the literature about this, but it's worth mentioning. Yeah, we had one at USF last year. There you go. So it is, it is still with us. So it's a presumptive diagnosis. You want to elicit history of exposure. Uh, parent, 25% uh, false negative with PPD. Quantiferon is usually used. And, uh, and sometimes you have to do a therapeutic trial. You know, the, the, just because the, the, the test of, that they've been exposed is positive, the uveitis may not be from TB. So you have to give a therapeutic trial and see how they do. It's usually given for three months and you see if they respond. Uh, anything on TB before we move on? Let me ask you a technical question that we were talking about. You know, a lot of these awesome old photos have the opaque fixation bar in them. Why don't we use that anymore? Is there a reason for that? Those Has it gotten in the way? The, <laughs> yeah, the, the fixation is better, yeah. The, the fixation is better because the lights are dimmer, maybe, no, or, yeah. or using false color. Have a look at a laser. Because it's a laser there's, fixator. There's things in there. That's, 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 that's what and, the and, and the truth is, yeah. even back then, yeah. once they got the patient fixated, they, they could take it out. They're supposed to move yeah, it out. They're supposed to move it out. Move it out. A lot of the photos, you see it kind of there. Yeah, that was an analog thing. Once things went digital, you could find things. Good point. Good question. So let's talk about syphilis. 
it, almost almost all uveitis patients are going to end up testing for syphilis. There's some exceptions, maybe with a first onset mild anterior uveitis, but it's it's a it's a, a big mimic, that's for sure. It's a spirochete. You can get gen congenital or acquired cases, and and it's becoming increasingly uh, common now. There's a rebound, especially in men who have sex with men. So so keep it in mind. It's uh, it's out there. We'll talk about congenital syphilis. Uh, you don't, I don't see that, but maybe Tampa General, maybe other places do. I don't see much of this in my in my practice, but but we'll talk a little bit about congenital syphilis because sometimes you'll have somebody with chorioretinal scarring that you don't know the etiology of, and you might suspect syphilis, and sometimes you can arrive at that with uh, other clinical cues. And another point about congenital syphilis is I have a case of that in um, Vanellis is that the RPR is positive in the offspring which is interesting, mm -hmm. even though they may not have any sexual history. Good point. And we're going to talk about testing, which I think is important. Yeah. Any other comments before I move? This is, this is a, cl a characteristic, classic finding in syphilis. And we've all seen this numerous times. Has anybody ever seen roseola? I've not. But, it, but in the book, I put it in here because the OCAPs might have it in. It's a focal dilation of the iris vessels, which in a uveitis patient is felt to be pathognomonic for syphilis, roseola. So it's good to know about it. That's what it looks like, but it's, it's not common. That's for sure. Here's uh, Hutchinson Beck teeth. They're small teeth, so because of the small, they're spaced, and they get the, the incisors get this notch. And that's the Hutchinson Beck teeth that you see in congenital syphilis. Um, mulberry or Moon's bowlers, they look at mulberry with little pits, big round bowlers, saber shins, congenital uh, perforated heart palate, <coughs> raggedies, you might see that in the older literature, little folds in the skin around the mouth that you would see with congenital syphilis. In my, in my practice, I, I've, I've found that the, the finding of interstitial keratitis can sometimes be helpful. These corneas are not always opaque. You can look at the cornea superficially and it looks fine. But if you look real carefully, you'll, you'll see what looks like a little more corneal nerves than usual. And then when you focus more carefully, you're going to realize that they loop. They're not nerves. They're avascular they're vessels. They're, they're, they're stromal corneal vessels that are no longer patent. And so they can be overlooked. But if you see interstitial keratitis with chorioretinal scars, it, it's a good cue. I've seen that on a number of patients for congenital syphilis. They'll often have the salt and pepper fundus. It's rather nonspecific. Here's a real bad case of interstitial keratitis. More things than syphilis cause interstitial keratitis, but it's one well-known cause. So here's an example of the salt and pepper, kind of RP-like uh, in some respect. In, 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 in appearance just grossly, vascular attenuation. So if you saw something like that, you would consider syphilis. This patient I saw, she had this retinal scarring and, and no symptoms, she just came in for a routine exam. But she had some uh, corneal vessels, some signs of interstitial keratitis, and she tested positive for, for syphilis. It was probably congenital. Now acquired syphilis is, it may, may be more, um, more uh, something that you may run across. It's divided into primary, secondary, and tertiary stages, but you can get ocular involvement in any, usually secondary or tertiary. Um, and, and sometimes cases don't run quite as classic as they, as they say. The, the, the chancre is painless. It, it looks like an ulcer, but it's interesting because you'd see this ulcer on the skin and it looks like it would be painful. It's usually indurated, uh, but it's painless and it goes away in a couple weeks. It doesn't go away quickly, so if a patient's had a chancre, they usually know it. Uh, then, then you get, then you get um, uh, septicemia, so you get lymphadenopathy, rash, sort of nonspecific, but, but a uveitis in 10% of patients. This, this rash of the palms and soles, originally described as papulosquamous and now papular, ma macular papular, is really classic, so if they have a rash on their hands, that's really typical for secondary It's hard symptoms. to miss. I saw one of those at Bayfront last year, and when you shake their hand, you, if you still shake their hands of your consults, <laughs> yeah, I made the diagnosis before I looked in the eye with a, it was a high risk, high risk patient. Can be, can be real helpful. 
And then tertiary syphilis, where they get a cardiac CNS. <coughs> yeah, you can do beaker bowel if you choose to, yeah. But you don't want to do that. You don't no, want to do that. I hear you can't catch syphilis by shaking hands. That's right. <laughs> so you don't want to do a, You don't do want to do a, a, a fist bump. Fist bump. So you can't see their palms. So you might go, hi. See what that <laughs> look like, yeah. That's true. That would work too. So this is an example of, of a shanker. Painless. See, if this it looks like an aphthous ulcer of a type, but it's, it's painless. That's, that's the distinguishing feature. Here's your rash on the skin and on the on palms. Here's a here's a, a gumma, by the way, it's just a granuloma. It's it's seen tertiary syphilis. It also looks really pretty bad, but tends to be painless. Sorry. So this is important. Um, uh, Dr. Gass described this, a posterior placoid chorioretinitis. What does placoid mean? What is placoid? What does it mean? We use it all the time. We must know what it means. You wouldn't know it if you didn't know what it meant. Would you? What is it, anybody? Plate. Placoid means plate. So this, this is a plate. Now, if you look at this picture, you don't see a plate. It looks pretty good, but look at this. There's the, there's the FA. So there is a retinitis that's in a, a serving plate-like fashion, serving you the diagnosis of syphilis. If you look back, you can actually see a little bit of an opacification here. The, the, you might have originally written off as a photographic artifact, but clinically you wouldn't. You, you would see a, a plate-like, a placoid. Where else do we use placoid? Nappy. Mm -hmm. There you get little tiny platelets. But here you get a big serving plate telling you this is syphilis. Yeah. This is important because this is really typical for syphilis. If you see this plate-like uh, placoid lesion, think syphilis, it probably is going to be syphilis. So you can get uveitis at any stage of the disease. Any structure could be affected. Always test for HIV, and in your HIV test, patients always test for syphilis. Now, this is important. Two tests have to be positive. So usually you'll order an MHA, or I use a FTA, in addition to VDR, RPR. Now this is important. I've, I've had tests lately where I've ordered my two tests, but they only order one, they only give you one test. And they'll say, well, the insurance only lets you do one test. Well, what you do is you t accept that one test, and then you separately order the other test. They have to be ordered separately. Thanks to all that. either Quest or LabCorp stopped for a while offering FTA. Mm -hmm. So that might be a good point. Yeah. Now, what, I was at the academy this year, and all the UVI's people seem to favor starting out with the FTA. Uh, which is a, a specific <laughs> test, a trepanemal test. And then, and then if it's positive, if it's positive, order the RPR, which is a non-specific uh, a non-specific test. But you have to have two tests. Let's say you, you have equivocal tests. What do you do? Immunoblot. Immunoblot for syphilis is the test you would order. But the first test that's, that's currently ordered now is the FTA or the MH. And then the RPR can be transient, right? It can. It can. This is much more reliable. Yeah. So if you're going to order one test, order FTA. And then if it's negative, you're okay. If it's positive, then you've got to confirm it. I remember that from training because the FTA means it's positive forever as mm -hmm. an F. Yeah, exactly. And then, of course, if, if you have ocular involvement, you've got to worry about neurosyphilis, send them on for puncture, such as that. How do you order an immunoplot? You just order it like a... Regular blood I've test. never had to order it, so I, I, I'm sure I'm going to have to do some research when it comes okay. to that. I'm sure they're going to send it out. They're going to say, you know what, and then you're yeah. going to have to go through the, <laughs> usual, the usual things. So before I leave syphilis, anything? So for patients who have had ocular syphilis and they get treatment, and are you kind of stuck if they ever have some sort of uveitis in that eye again? Are you stuck assuming it's just ocular this syphilis is a good and question. treating the IV? Typically, again? if they're treated, their RPR becomes negative. So, so if they get another infection, their RPR goes up. So you'll test them for FTA, and it's positive, and you'll say, well, that doesn't tell me anything, and you can't make the diagnosis. You do the RPR, or if that's equivalent, call the immunoblot, and, and then you move forward. And then, of course, you have whether, it's, whether the problem is consistent with syphilis, and then if, if there's any question, you would treat them, do a therapeutic trial, this sort of thing. But the RPR tends to go negative after they've been treated. Something a uveitis person told me is a problem with the resurgence of syphilis is people have forgotten how to treat it, so it gets partially treated, and then it goes away for a while, and the RPR <coughs> goes down, then it comes back, 
because they're not getting the intravenous penicillin, you know, Good for a, a long time. Yeah, yeah. yeah, you really have to follow these yeah, people. You really can't just say that you got an infection, <laughs> see an infectious disease, next cataract. You, you really have to follow it through and be sure they know what to do because there is some confusion. And, and, and surprisingly, sometimes you have to kind of guide your, your specialists in terms of what needs to be done. Um, Classic OCAP question is what do you do in a penicillin allergic patient with tertiary syphilis? Desensitize. Say again. You desensitize them. You have to, you have to just submit them to the ICU and desensitize them to penicillin. So great point. Great point. Um, I would say consult infectious disease. <laughs> 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 I don't know. Not sure yet. You know, Scott. One quick thing before you move on is I was just thinking when you mentioned interstitial keratitis. When I was in residency, we saw it constantly. Yeah. And you may have. I haven't yeah. seen one in about 10 years, and I was just looked up that mandatory syphilis testing for marriage was instituted in the U.S. in 1930. There you go. And then it was phased out in 85 because it had largely gone away. Very so interesting. So when we were younger, our patients, I saw tons of it. Yeah, I did too. Very good point. Yeah. Excellent. If I, if I can add something. Please. So, um, the treatment criteria for syphilis is a fourfold decrease in RPR. I don't know if that contributes to the resurgence of syphilis after treatment. Okay, good point. Um, people aren't following for that decrease, yeah. you think, maybe? Possibly. Or maybe they're missing some just by looking at the RPR and maybe mm -hmm. treat the patient at the lab. Yeah, I'm sure reinfection is common, too. And then second thing is that we saw in residency a case of negative RPR. We were sure it was syphilis. TP, the FDA was positive, but the RPR kept coming back negative, and apparently there's this... There's Did this, you get the immuno what? Well, we didn't get the immuno blob, but what happens is we started treating the patient, and then the RPR showed up, and it was a high titer. So what apparently happens is that for ozone phenomenon. Yes, yeah, exactly. Yeah, see, the, 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 yeah, the, the nonspecific tests are flocculation tests, the RPR yeah. and such as that, those are flocculation tests. And if there's not the right, proper ratio, they will get flocculation. Yep. So you can have a real high titer, and, and they won't get, it won't show up on the RPR unless they dilute the serum. It's yep. called a prozone effect. Yep. And that's what you're talking about. Good point. But again, you're going to order the FDA anyway, so, so you're not going to give up on them. All right. Um, excellent. So, oh, wait a I want, if please. If you can't use penicillin, you can't desensitize them, what do you use? You can't they use septriaxin? There's no choice. That's, that's the OCAP question. That's the OCAP answer, yeah. yeah. I think, you have to desensitize them. I think if you really can, it's either septriaxin or erythromycin or something, but like she was saying, they always desensitize. I mean, there's interesting. Yeah. I've never <coughs> faced that. <laughs> All right. So Bartonella and cat scratch, same thing. Um, um, it's a gram negative rod. I've seen a fair number of cat scratch cases over the years, so you will see them if you look for them. Um, antecedent flu like illness is common. They might or might not have adenopathy <coughs> at the site of either a, a scratch up from a kitten, choosing a kitten, or a flea bite. So they're not, you don't all, they don't always say they got a scratch. It could be a flea bite. Uh, they don't always get adenopathy. Uh, but you can get Paranon's oculoglandular syndrome, which I haven't seen in forever. You, neuroretinitis, this is important. It isn't common, but it's, it's, it's the most common cause of neuroretinitis. And they also get this very peculiar, very small multifocal retinochoroiditis, which we'll talk about. And then rarely an angiomatous lesion of the disc, which I've never seen. So here is your classic case of focal retinitis from Bartonella. Everybody recognizes this right off the bat. Where is the retinitis? <laughs> now, now, that could have easily have been missed, but, is, but the other eye, the other eye, oops, is yeah. this. So if you see this and you see these, you're going to go back and look at the other eye. And if you see a neuroretinitis with these little focal retinitis in both eyes, or even just in that eye, that's usually cat scratch. It isn't, it isn't uh, pathognomonic, but it's usually cat scratch. What is neuroretinitis? How do you diagnose neuroretinitis? The retina and nerve inflamed. Retina and nerve is inflamed. So you have a swollen nerve, there's a nerve, and the retinitis is, the retinitis they're talking about is it, the stellate pattern. That's, that, that's neuroretinitis. So if you have a disc edema with a little stellate pattern, that is neuroretinitis. But that doesn't give you the diagnosis. We'll talk about that. And in, in early neuroretinitis, you're going to get disc edema, and this won't come till later. 
So, so, so you might have a patient who has disc edema, they come back a week or two later, then they got the stellate pattern, you go, oh, this is aneuroretinitis. How does that help you? It helps you classify the disease and, and funnel down the diagnostic possibilities, which we will talk about. Those photos are from our St. Pete office on an analog camera. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, what's the treatment, doxycycline, erythromycin in children? Why, with, well, the rest of us all know this, why erythromycin in children? Why not? Why not doxycycline? Mess with your teeth and bones. Yeah, exactly. Thank you. So, good. So, I put this slide up here. I think this is instructive. These are infectious etiologies of neuroretinitis. So, you, so once you diagnose neuroretinitis, you don't have the etiology, but you know what to think of. And for the infectious diseases, you're going to have clues. Have they been around kittens? Usually, the, usually the, the mature cats don't get the Bartonella, the kittens get it. Um, you know, is, is it a syphilis candidate? Um, is it a, a sewer worker or somebody who's been around animals to get leptospirosis, like cattle? Um, TB exposure uh, uh, around dogs, toxicare. So there's a big, long list of things that it can be, tick, tick bites. We'll kind of give you a clue to, to, to narrow it down. And there are non-infectious etiologies of so-called neuroretinitis, the most important one being hypertension. So if you have neuroretinitis, particularly if you have some evidence of bilaterality, you can check their blood pressure. That may be all it is. It may not be infectious at all. I saw so, a patient. Uh, go ahead. I saw a patient that went to USF with diagnosed with neuroretinitis, was on treatment. I, um, I was consulted for this patient in the ER, uh, and their blood pressure was over 200 systolic. Can we ever check blood pressure in clinic? <laughs> it happens. It, it happens. So you really, when you see neuroretinitis, think hypertension, think, think blood pressure. And the automated cuffs can miss it. Yeah, very good very point. High blood very good point. It's a problem. And you know, pseudotuber cerebri can get the stellate deposits. All, almost anything that causes optic disc edema could cause stellate uh, findings, which would put them in a category of neuroretinitis. Um, so it's keep you keep your net wide, but again, the most common non-infectious is hypertension. The most common infectious is cat scratch. Protozoan. I think your book uses the word protozoan. I don't think a lot of classifications are using protozoa anymore. Uh, there was the protozoa, which was under animal. Protozoa means pre-animal. It was under the animal kingdom, and and then sporozoas were the were the uh, the uh, toxoplasma. Now they use protista, which is its own kingdom. Uh, basically, protista is like a uh, trash can of, of, of entities. If, if you're a eukaryote, and if you're not an animal, and you're not a plant, and you're not a fungus, you're a protista. So, so it's a loose collection of organisms that aren't really very w related. Um, they include uh, 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 algae, uh, slime molds, uh, toxo, a lot of other flagellates, uh, motile organisms, but they don't go anywhere, don't belong anywhere else. So it's protista. The the fi the phylum is uh, anti uh, AP complexa because they have apical infolds in the sporozoites. I just put there are others that you might need to know about crypto. But let's talk about toxoplasmosis. This is really important, as we mentioned earlier, the number one cause of focal retinitis. Um, the cat is the definitive host, so it's only in the cat that this, this organism could undergo sexual reproduction, but it can affect almost any mammal. Almost any mammal can have toxo, and they get, they get cysts, particularly in the muscles. So if you eat undercooked meat from pretty much any animal, you can get toxoplasmosis. If you're going to ingest, oh, if you choose to ingest oocysts, uh, <clears throat> then you're getting them from the cat, because the cat's the only one that produced the, the, the oocysts. Uh, through the, through the uh, digestive tract. Um, and, and, and the prevalence varies. France is up like 80%. I don't know whether it's because they love cats or because they love undercooked meat. But France is real high with their infectious rate. We'll see a lot of people from Brazil with toxoplasmosis. Um, and people on cruise boats, people get it after cruises. There you go. It's very anecdotal, but that's why we see it here. Yeah, place. good point. Another thing, too, I should mention, I've seen people who've gotten it and they didn't eat raw meat, but they had, they had they had vegetables that were fertilized <laughs> with manure, and so they, they it wasn't clean. So, so it doesn't have to be meat necessarily. So the congenital cases are usually bilateral and multifocal, and they can have CNS changes. These cysts tend to like the brain and muscles, but they can go pretty much anywhere. Um, 
uh, multifocal retinitis uh, suggests HIV disease. What I'm, saying, what I'm saying here is if, if you have toxoplasmosis that's really severe or multifocal and it's toxol, think HIV because the immune system is down. And I had a, elder patients present with huge areas of mid-peripheral or peripheral retinitis from toxo as well. So here's a nice case of congenital toxo. The other eye was involved. There's multifocal inactive chorioretinal scars uh, here like this. They're often not very pigmented, very sharp borders, and these lesions are kind of excavated. If you did an OCT over that or just look in carefully, it looks excavated. And then there was quite a bit of vitreous organization, which you don't always get with toxoplasmosis, but you can. Here's another case, a pretty typical case of an old congenital toxoplasma scar. Now, is this toxoplasma? Maybe. It's pretty pigmented. It's not really scalloped. It doesn't look exactly like the others. I thought it might be an old toxo scar. I wasn't sure, but they came back later. So this is really important. If you have a patient with focal retinitis next to a corneal retinal scar, that, that pretty much senses a diagnosis. They had a reactivation. The cis oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Turn off your phone. <laughs> sorry. So, there we go. Sorry, I think I got it. So, so again, that's a, that's a helpful clinical could to see an old scar with an acute reactivation. What happens is they get, they get cysts that can stay in a cyst form for a long, long time, and the bradyzoites slowly divide non asexually within this cyst, and then the cyst breaks open. What happens is all throughout your life, somebody who has toxo, they have these cysts, and they're constantly breaking open, and then you get a little bit of inflammation. They resolve. It, it sort of happens on and on and on. But, but uh, periodically you'll get somebody who will be symptomatic in the eye and then we'll typically treat it. So it doesn't have anything to do with their uh, um, immune state? The, the, we're told that, that the immune, the, immune the, 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 the organism waits till your immune system drops like as you get older or something and then it comes out. But they've, they've shown that in a lot of animals there's about a one or two percent rupture rate per year. Uh, but I think what happens is if your immune system isn't compromised your body handles it. If your body, if your body, if you have immunocompromised, you're, you're older, or whatever, then you're more likely to get symptomatic. So compromise just meaning just older is, is enough to compromise you to the point where you can have reactions. Yeah, yes. Yeah. So you don't have to be worried yeah. about malignancy or something. You know, I think you would you would think about that, and if you had symptoms, you probably wouldn't test for malignancy without any other cue in an older patient. But but certainly you would think about that. If, what what made their immune system drop specifically? And speaking of syphilis. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Any other questions? Yes. Um, and in toxo patients, um, oftentimes think about testing for HIV because it does change the length of your management. So. Great point. Great point. So keep this picture in mind. Now here is an area where there's no scarring, just a focal area of retinitis, and this was. Well, this was toxoplasmosis. Again, the number one cause, the first thing you look for, first thing you think about, the first thing you test for. Do you order labs on the primaries? If there's a pigmented spot, I typically don't order labs, but I do order labs. I do, and you'll often order IgM as well yeah, to see if it was acutely IgM. acquired, yeah. And, and what are Corellius plaques? Corellius plaques are these little things here, these little white things that you see on the arterioles, and that's also real typical for toxoplasmosis. They're often remote from the actual lesion, and uh, they're often seen. They're seen in other diseases, but they're real typical for toxic. Are they always that small? Huh? Are they always that small? Yeah, they're usually pretty fine. They're, they're often multiple, but they're pretty fine. Yeah, good question. So here is a patient with a little bit of retinitis. That doesn't look like toxoplasmosis, but you can get punctate outer uh, toxoplasmosis. Just keep it in mind. It can be real subtle like that, and then and they can get some retinal fluid. Is that in uh, immunocompromised? Typically not. Okay. And that's probably why it's so mild, because they, they have a good immune system, so they're not showing us florid, uh, florid uveitis. And they're treated and they get little small pigmented spots. You don't see much of this, but it was hot in the literature about 20 years ago. So how do you treat it? When, when we first started treatment, we had the classic treatment. Three antibiotics, and you had to check their, their platelet count and stuff so that they wouldn't get it. From medicine, or if they were really bad, you'd have to mice, didn't have to worry about uh, clostridial uh, 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 um, colitis. Uh, but nowadays, most people just use sulfa septra. 
Uh, and, and, and some people, if, if they're mild, not very symptomatic, and they're periphery, and they have normal immune constitution, you can just observe them, and they'll, they'll get better on their own. So that's even an option. But, uh, but most people seem to go this route as opposed to the classic treatment. But if you had a really severe case, or it was threatening the macular of the disc, then it would probably warrant really going full force. And you might even add uh, intravitreal injections. Oh, I don't have it there. You can give intravitreal injections as well. Um, Intravitreal clinda, I think, right? Yes, correct. Especially in yeah. pregnancy. Oh, there you go. I That's a great one. Yeah, spiromycin can be used. I think so. Uh, a scepter can be used in pregnancy, unless I'm wrong. Anybody? I'm pretty sure you can use scepter, but they often you say can. spiromycin. Well, so you, yeah. you do have. But some people might prefer the intravitreal, so they're not getting systemic, because people are, are quite uh, properly concerned about that. Um, now keep this, this is important, I think. You treat for four to six weeks. At the end of four to six weeks, is it gone? No, there's usually some whitening still there. The borders have become a little better defined, but it's not gone. It'll slowly heal over a couple months after that. So you don't necessarily have to keep these people on treatment for months and months and months. You can stop it after four to six weeks, monitor them as long as they're continuing to get better, you're fine. Here we have the intravitreal endomycin. And some people add dexamethasone. I'm always a little reluctant to add steroids, but that's something that could be done in a severe case, especially maybe after the first injection. Anything else? Any other comments, questions on toxoplasma? One little one. A congenital toxoplasmosis, because of the brain calcifications, I warn them that someday someone may want to do a brain biopsy on you, and you might want to mention to them you have congenital toxoplasma, because I've had one or two patients come in, so they're like got a thing, it's like, what's going on? So I just had a brain biopsy, like a, you know, and they That's a great talk, point. So. Yeah, educate the patients in terms of what other manifestations that might come across. Because it's, yeah, the diagnosis may be clear to us, but it might not be so clear for the extraocular manifestations. So helmets, we're not going to talk about sister sarcosis because it wasn't in your book this year. We're not going to talk about oncocercosis, but we will catch these other two uh, roundworms. So toxocariasis, cats or dogs uh, can have their own respective organism. It's fairly uncommon, mostly in kids, because they eat dirt, uh, where the oil has been excreted, uh, but not, not exclusively. Uh, it can come on acutely, but often it can go, come on sort of insidiously, because the kids just don't really complain about it. Uh, ocular disease is rarely present in visceral larval migraines. In visceral larval migraines, you get hyper eosinophilia, uh, uh, splenomegaly, you know, hepatomegaly, you get, you get uh, organs disease, but typically they don't get ocular. And typically ocular don't get visceral. But if you have somebody who is having systemic symptoms, you certainly want to cue in their internist about that as well. You can get leukoporia, localized macular granuloma, or peripheral granuloma. We'll talk about these. Uh, they're typically unilateral. You can even get a pars planitis, which is just simply where the worm is way out in the periphery. So it doesn't cause a, you, you don't see the granuloma in the, in the retina. You keep, keep that diagnosis in mind. Now this I think is important. They, they typically get these granulomas, uh, the sort of chorioretinal granulomas, and this, and this classic fibrous pattern. If it's a posterior lesion, for some reason you get this condensation of the vitreous to the disc. If it's in the periphery, you get this splayed out vitreous condensation that goes out usually to the, to the uh, vitreous base. And, and, and these are real typical presentations with that vitreous reaction for, for resolved toxocariasis. These are inactive cases. They don't need to be treated. But at least you, you know what most likely the organism is. And you can certainly test the blood to see if they've been exposed for confirmation. Uh, if, if it were acute, you'd see active inflammation at the same time. But those vitreous are, are fi the findings are, are important. LISA is the test that you do for it. Uh, uh, steroids are used because as the organism dies, it creates inflammation. So you want to you want to su uh, suppress the inflammation. But there's no established role for anti-helminthics because usually you're seeing it when the, the, the organism has died. So it's a lot of times subclinical, like toxoplasmosis. Yes, you'll just see the patient come in and. and You'll maybe see leukocoria or you'll more. For us, we'll see the retinal lesion and we'll say, oh, you had, you know, you've been exposed to toxocara. So that's, that's my case. I've, 
I don't think if maybe when I was in Miami did I have actually seen. Of course, I don't see a lot of kids. You all see kids. Have you seen many acute toxicocaros? No, 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 not, not yeah. one that I've successfully identified as an acute yeah. toxicocaro. You know, one thing is important to mention, I suppose, is that for leukocoria, because that's that no-cap sort of thing, you, you can always think of retinoblastoma, then you'll keep it in the differential diagnosis. Toxocara is in the differential diagnosis. Probably all of you know that. Anything, anything last on toxocara? Sorry, I'm not doing too well in time here. Shall I keep going or shall I stop? Um, Lyme disease. It's the most common tick-borne illness in the United States. Um, but, but, but it's interesting because there were a lot of papers about it about 20, 30 years ago. And now you don't see much of it. And the uveitis people at the academy this year were wondering whether those cases were really Lyme disease. But I think it does exist. Um, it's a spirochete. And like a spirochete, like syphilis, it can, it can manifest itself in many different ways. Um, the reservoir is wide. We usually think of deers and deer tick, but, but, the, but the other animals can get it as well, including your cats and dogs. And the idea is, is that the deer tick is little. That's all this is trying to tell you. You think of big, giant ticks, and the deer ticks tend to be small, so they might not be very easily noticed. And then there are the stages. Not everybody gets uh, uh, erythema chronica migrans, but if you have that history, it really helps a lot. If they've, if they've not had it, then you're sort of in limbo as to whether they have it or not. Have, just like syphilis, stage one, stage two, stage three, same sort of a concept. Here's an example of erythema chronica migraine. It lasts weeks to months, so it's not going to go away overnight. If they've had this, they will probably know it. And they get this ring-like lesion that sort of expands over time. Ocular involvement, it goes from conjunctivitis, episcleritis, anterior uveitis. Intermediate uveitis is the most common presentation, so keep that in your diagnosis. Again, when we're, when we're doing our exams, you're going to say, okay, I have a patient with inflammation, it's primarily in the vitreous, and then you're going to be thinking intermediate uveitis, what causes intermediate uveitis? You'd include this, you'd include multiple sclerosis, you'd think sarcoidosis. There are a couple things that you would typically think of. In, in, in the, the value of looking at, at, at where the primary inflammation is located. So here is neuroretinitis, and what is this picture lacking? I just told you it's neuroretinitis. Yeah, you're not getting the star. And it could be because it was out of the picture, or it could be that this is acute and the star hasn't developed yet. So neuroretinitis, Lyme disease is in there along with cat scratch. Here's some vitreous opacities. Looks a little bit like sarcoidosis, or uh, candidate, excuse me. Except it's you. Is, there, is that true? Is it changing? I, I think that, that may be true, right? and that's why they didn't used to require immunoblot, but now they require Requiring immunoblot. And if that. immunoblot's positive, you've got it. Okay. So that's the difference. But, but having said that, it's rare. Yeah, it's it's rare. really rare. But the positive labs are common, evidently. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But the immunoblock positive. So, so you've the got one I got, it was there was ten things. Ten and things. They said three of them had to be positive, right. and I have one positive. Yeah. So they said that. And that, that's the panel they're talking about. Yeah. That all these internists or family docs are ordering and then treating people chronically for some positivity for one, yeah. on that panel. The panel right. Said no. Right. Good point. So Dusen. This is important. The name is really helpful here. It's diffuse, generally, except early in the disease it might be somewhat uh, semi-focal. It's unilateral, so you have a bilateral uveitis, it's not Dusen. It's subacute. They don't come in rip-roaring uveitis. They'll tell you they've had floaters for months. And then it's a, and it can present, it can present as a neuroretinitis, although late in the disease it looks more like RP. And that's where you'll often see these people. They're often, often young people who, who are, who are uh, just come in and they, they're not having a lot of symptoms. They, they, the two species are suspected. The truth is there's probably a lot of, a lot of little worms that, that can cause this. There's a small worm in the southeast that's probably ancylostoma from the dog. Or, or even some people say toxo. There's a lot of debate about that. There's a larger worm in the Midwest that's probably a raccoon round worm, Bailus iscaris. It's insidious. Uh, visual acuity, floaters are, 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 are prominent, they get a vitritis, and they get the little focal areas of gray-white, not, not bright white, but gray-white retinitis, and you'll see a, a little worm-like cast in the RPE, maybe more than one. You'll think, this guy's got a, he's got a plethora of worms. But they're, they're casts, and, and sometimes the casts are hard to differentiate from the, from the worm itself, and the only way to differentiate is if it moves. 
So if you're looking at this little thing, it looks like a worm, but it doesn't move, it's probably a cast. But at least it points out the casts help you with the diagnosis uh, of, the, of the problem. And then in the late disease, the, the worm is usually gone at this point. Everything's shot. They have a little bit of peripheral field, but all their central vision's gone. It, lo it looks like RP, except the vision is a reverse. With RP, you'd have no field, and maybe a little central island of 20-20 vision. In Dusen, you have no central vision, but maybe a little bit of peripheral field. They, they lose vision centrally early. Early, yeah, exactly. In the disease, it's and, and much, much worse visual loss than you would expect, given the degree of disease. That's a great point. So here's a worm, and it actually moves, so we knew this was the actual worm. The, the treatment is to identify, the, the key is to identify the worm and treat it with laser. Doing this, succeeding at that, is another matter. It's not easy. The, the fundus camera can often find the worms easier than you can at the slit lap, so you might yeah, have to yeah, stick your photographer. a woman down there who knew how to find them. I've yeah, never Dita, found the worm on my own. Dita has found them for him. Yeah. She was yeah. his photographer. Yeah, you were down there. Yeah. <laughs> So here is a late case of, of Dusen. It looks kind of like RP. You get a pale disc, you get attenuated vessels, you get some intraretinal pigment migration, a generalized modding, modeling of the pigment epithelium, but it's unilateral. There's no central vision, just a little bit of peripheral vision. And uh, that's a, a typical mm -hmm. Dusen up here. Do you bother treating it at that stage? I There's no need to. Uh, well, you look for a worm. If you still see a worm, you can save a little bit, but you're not going to recover vision, unfortunately. Not at that stage, but you do recover vision if you get it. Earlier stage, you bet. Stages. You bet. Especially at a neuroretinitis stage. And isn't there a uh, medicine that I used to be able to Oh, Bendazole they've been using, but, but, uh, but there's a lot of debate as to whether that does yeah. anything. I suspect, though, if you have a patient who you say, this is, I think this is Dusen, I can't find the worm, or I found the worm and I can't laser it, most people would put them on albendazole for a month, but, but um, we don't know much about its effectiveness. So we talked about most of this. Rare, rarely there's CNS involvement. We talked about this. So let's, anything more about Dusen? I have a question. So when you, when you laser with these patients, do you, you, you start them on steroids afterwards? To prevent Usually the worm is so small you don't have to. That's okay. a great question. Some of the bigger organisms, you would have to do that, okay. like cystosarcosis and such, but, but these, these lesions typically not. Good. All right, let's talk about West Nile virus. I think the importance for you, for, especially for the OCAP, is that, is that West Nile now is in the U.S., so you might expect to see it. And this is important, it's a, they have a typical chorioretinitis that I think is worthwhile recognizing, sort of pattern recognition. So I want you to know about that. Uh, birds carry it around all over the United States and the mosquitoes get you. And most are subclinical, by the way, uh, but, but some people do get neuro, uh, neurological symptoms and death in, in, the, in, in some people. So they might have just generalized uveitis symptoms, vitreous cells, but it's the chorioretinitis that I want you to know about. That, I think, is what the OCAPs are going to be all about. And this is real typical. These linear, these linear sort of a, a chorioretinal scars, but, but I, I like this picture. There is some isolated, but typically you can see this lineation. Often it's sort of along the retinal vessels or the choroidal vascular pattern, and that's worth mem memorizing if you see inactive chorioretinal scars in that distribution, um, think, think uh, West Nile, then you can try to get the history or, or do blood tests to confirm. And I think that really is the, the key to, to know about West Nile. The Zika, I think the main thing to know about Zika virus is that it is in the U.S., as you know, it, it came from, I think, Brazil to Miami, and uh, mosquito born, and, and, and it, it causes severe uh, microcephaly in, in babies, and all kinds of chorioretinal Changes nothing classic for Zika. I think you you want to know the, the impact. Most adults are asymptomatic, but it, it'll really get the babies if the mother's infected during pregnancy. Here's one picture from Dr. Ventura that's just so smart. He changed. They can get scallop scars, optic nerve changes. There's nothing typical about Zika that we know of at this point. The main thing that you want to know about Ebola is that after the disease is over, if the person survives. The organism can stay in the eye because it's sort of immune protected. So the virus can stay in the eye for a long time and then flare up later. There was a classic case in Emory that, uh, that presented like that. And now subsequently in Africa, they're identifying that, that, yes, that's the case. The organism can stay. So uh, unfortunately, once you've survived it, you still have the organism. Would you be infectious to hmm? others? I'm sorry? Would you be infectious to others? I wouldn't be. 
No. no, that's a great question. I, I think the potential would be there. You know, if it's in the eye and then, and then if it could spread, I don't think we know about that. My impression is, though, is they're treating it as though it would be. Yeah, as I recall, they were very nervous about that. Yeah, patient. yeah. Great there question. There are treatments for it now. There's a, yeah, there's, there's, a, a, there's uh, a, a vaccine there. Vaccine, actually, and there's something I read in the Time magazine. It was right. There, there, there's antivirals. It was in the there, Wall Street Journal two days ago. Maybe that's what it was. Oh, that's yeah. excellent. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> They, uh, they had a nice article about uh, uh, the man who uh, helped develop it in, in the Congo, and uh, it's uh, it's an immune therapy. I, I think it's an antibody that, from a survivor. Excellent. And so they, they replicated the antibody, and you know, just like we use antibodies for anti-VEGF, I think they have this antibody they can give you a shot of it, to, and it, it increases survival from to about 35 percent if you catch it early from a 90 yeah. percent fatality rate. Yeah, major progress for sure. Chikungunya, for those of you who speak Kimakande, it means uh, that which contorts or that which bends because these people with chikungunya get a real bad arthralgia so they're all crippled, you know, all, all they're in pain and, and, and uh, that's the, the history you would get. There's no classic retinitis, just be aware chikungunya is out there uh, you, you, would, you would know the, the systemic symptoms for sure, and they can get, they can get retinitis and optic neuritis. Here's, some, here's a little focal area of retinitis. It's nonspecific. A little bit of hemorrhage, nonspecific. Nonspecific, a little bit of a stellate deposit. So nothing specific. Just know about the disease. Know about the systemic manifestations. Treatment is just supportive. There's no specific treatment for chicken cunea. Okay, post-test. Get your papers out. We're going to get this right. We, we're going to show that this lecture was valuable, that everything was clear, all questions were answered. And just so that I can uh, get back with you individually to help with any, any problems that, where I wasn't clear, if you just jot your name down, if this is a new piece of paper, and I'll, and I'll, uh, I'll give you feedback. So, number one. Wait, do we have any more? Sure. I have more paper. Anybody needs the paper? Thank you. Read paper. Yeah, let me see if I'll take a paper. <laughs> yeah, give give Rita, give Rita, give Rita a paper. I didn't catch one on the phone. I'm not going to give Harry one because he's knows the one. Sorry, I went beyond my time, by the way. Thank you. Everybody, everybody set. Looks like we're, we're almost set. Okay, we're set. We got that one. Number two. Zapping these out left and right. Good. Number three, serving you on a plate. Never going to miss this again. Did you come up with a serving you on a plate? Yeah, yeah I really I like that. that. I last night I saw that. I, I like was that. trying to make it entertaining. All right. Looks like we're all set. We got that one. Here we go. It's not very specific, but we know the most common infectious cause. This is an infectious lecture, so we know that we know the the type of uveitis that helps us could be anything, but we know it probably is. Plays with kittens. I want everybody to make a hundred. Okay, here we go. Focal retinitis. This is number five. Distractory. My pretest is not very good. Well, you guys are going much faster, much faster now. This is making me feel good. Okay, what is this? Good. Good. And this. <laughs> I didn't collect your first sheet, so I do want your, your address as well, your email if you don't mind. I think we're all set. Try this one. We know that pattern. Oh, yeah, we're coming to those good ones. Here, okay, this is a good one. Focus on the retina, focus on the vitreous. Good, very nice. All right, 
somebody's giving me a differential diagnosis, it looks like. Good, here's another one. Okay, don't forget our subretinal and preretinal hypopion. We can never forget that now. We'll never, ever <laughs> forget that. This is our extra credit. If you get this one, you get a gold star. 70% on the pretest just for disclosure. <laughs> they were the exact same order. Yeah. Really? Did I miss one? On the pre test? Mm -hmm. Oh, I thought you always saw yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, I just fell out of in your future. <laughs> what, what are you doing next year? I don't know about that. <laughs> 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 Cataract <laughs> surgery. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you all. Um, let's get my questionnaire off the web if, if that would be helpful for you. Thank you.